Hey, we are at the Peabody Public Library in Columbia City. My name is Janet Skank. We are interviewing a William Tarleton today. Um, Ms. Tarleton, could you state your full name, please? Uh, William T. Tarleton. And what is your birth date? Uh, 3 6 25. And where do you currently, currently reside? At uh, Columbia City, Indiana. And what wars did you serve? Uh, in World War II and Korea. And um, your branch of service? Uh, Navy. And the highest rank that you obtained? Uh, Radio and third class. Okay. Mr. Tarleton, um, you're not from Indiana. You were born in Marriott, you said? Uh, Marietta. Marietta, Ohio. Ohio. What brought you to Indiana? Uh, a railroad. A railroad. I'm a railroader. Okay. <laughs> And uh, I was transferred down here from Cleveland, Ohio, uh, uh, in uh, 1964. Okay. And I've been in Indiana ever since. Okay. So you were living actually in Ohio when you when you went went into the service the, for the uh, first yes. time. Yes. Okay. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, what what uh, how did you get into the service? You volunteer or drafted? Yes, or? I, I volunteered. Okay. And I was 17. You were 17, and you volunteered in 1943. Mm-hmm. Um, February. February of 43. Uh, and did you have older brothers and sisters? Well, I had three sisters, yes. You had three sisters? Mm-hmm. All older. All yeah. older. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you really couldn't get into the war until 43. Did you, did you require per, per, um, parental permission at your age at 17? Oh, yes. Did oh, you? Oh, yeah. Uh, fact is, that's a little bit of a story. Uh, my mother I enlisted in February, and my mother, I would be 18 in March the 6th, and my mother uh, had a deal with the uh, recruiting officer where I would be held out until my birthday on 18. She could do that? <laughs> she, she did. Okay. Okay. Um, your mother and father were living then? Uh, yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. How about any other extended family in Ohio then? Uh, just sisters, that's just all. Just your sisters, mm -hmm. okay. Do you, did you have friends that were in the service or going into the service? Oh my, yes. The uh, fact is, of all of people that I ran around with, men of course, <coughs> excuse me, uh, and were drafted or enlisted, whatever, at the same time practically. Okay. How uh, how old were you then when Pearl Harbor was attacked? Well, see, I'd be what sixteen. Uh, I think I was sixteen. Sixteen. Let's see, forty-one, December, uh, twenty-five to forty-one, and sixteen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, do you remember what you were doing when you heard about it? Uh, yes, I do very clearly. I was uh, at my sister, oldest sister's house, and I was reading the Sunday paper, laying on the floor. And the news came over the radio. Mm -hmm. Did you even know there was a Pearl Harbor before that? Nope. <laughs> I never heard of the place. Okay, so you you, um, <clears throat> you decided to volunteer to enlist, and when you were seventeen, and your mom waited, made did you wait, made you wait until you were actually eighteen Eight, to go. That's right. Um, me in. Where did you once you once they got you? Where did you go? When, when you uh, Great service? Lakes, Indiana, or. Uh, Great Lakes. The Great Lakes. Uh, what was that for? At boot camp. For boot camp. Can you tell mm -hmm. us a little bit about what boot camp was like? Uh, it's just a, a, a place where they, they train you, uh, not very much, but uh, a little bit about the Navy. Okay. Uh, you, they teach you how to tie knots and march and march and march. and. <laughs> How long did that take the boot camp? Oh, I think we were there about uh, 10 weeks. Okay. And then I went to, uh, they transferred me to radio school at Northwestern University. And I was there, I think, five months. And uh, from there... How, how did they decide to send you to that school? Did you ask to go uh, to that school? Or? They, they gave you a test. Uh, actually, at the time, I was a uh, junior machinist with, with civil service, okay? Now the Navy, bless their heart, uh, decided that they needed radio. 
So when I took the test, it looked like I ought to make a good radio. And uh, that's how it happened. <laughs> I sent me to radio school, uh -huh. and I was a machinist. Uh, Ms. Charles, were you married at this time yet? No, no. Okay. Okay. No. okay. Okay, so you you went to boot camp, uh, you went to boot camp the Great Lakes, and they sent you to Northwestern for radio school. Um, how long did that take? Radio school? Mm -hmm. Oh, that was about five months. About five months. No, no, let's see. Uh, June, July, August, September, October. Yeah, five months. What's that like it being being in this? Had you been away from home before? What was it like being uh, in the No, service? I hadn't been. Well, no, I'll take that back. I, I was uh, working at uh, Patterson Field in Dayton, Ohio, as a machinist when I enlisted. So okay. that was away from home. Okay. And that was only about a, uh, about a year. I went to school mm -hmm. before and then right into civil service. Can you tell us anything about the people that you met either in boot camp or in radio school? Did you become friends with them or how, how the did you, did you, were you able to like keep in contact with these people during the war? How, how, how did that go? I mean, no, were like uh, we were all sent different places, you know, okay. and uh, I, I don't know of any of the uh, uh, people from boot camp. Now from my ship, the first ship I was on, yes, okay. uh, we had a reunion two years in a row. And uh, we got together, but surprisingly enough, there wasn't very many of us left uh, that wanted to be in the uh, reunion. Mm -hmm. I think that maybe there's only about uh, oh 25 or something like that. And now this is in 1996, uh, the first year mm -hmm. reunion. And then '97, and that's the last I attempted. <coughs> Excuse uh, me. You you served on the USS Fleming. Fleming. Mm -hmm. What kind of ship was that? That's a destroyer escort. Our main duty was escorting ships and anti-submarine warfare, basically. How many pe how many men usually served on uh, on that ship? Uh, well, it uh, it had a crew of uh, two hundred. And it was uh, 289 feet long, and uh, maybe 40 feet wide. And uh, we mounted uh, three 76-millimeter uh, guns, plus uh, hedgehogs and, and uh, depth charges. Our main uh, duty was anti-submarine. And uh, well, I shouldn't say that's the main. Main was was uh, escorting ships and then secondary uh, uh, fighting submarines. The fact is, we sank a submarine. You did? Yes, in, uh, well, the west of Anahuita. But uh, that's beside the point. No, that's an important part of the story. Oh, well, we'll and get to that later. Okay. <laughs> <clears throat> and from radio school, did you go directly to your ship then? Yes. And where yes. did you go there to get, get on your uh, 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 the, they put me on a train out of uh, Chicago, of course, it, da, down to uh, San Jose, which was a distributing, uh, well, there's a name for that, uh, where they send the crew, the uh, people, and then they just send them every place from right there. And from there I was sent to the ship, and I arrived on the ship at about 11 o'clock on November the 30th, and the next day we sailed for Pearl Harbor in the morning. And we arrived at Pearl Harbor uh, December the 6th, and we stayed outside the harbor because the captain wanted to go through the channel into Pearl Harbor December the 7th, oh. <laughs> 1943, <laughs> two years after Pearl Harbor. But that's a uh, how, how long did you stay in, in Pearl Harbor then? Did you get to... Uh, we had training, uh, training? With, with a submarine and uh, we would fire or shoot off duds uh, 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 like um, 
depth charges and stuff like that. And they would fire torpedoes at us, blanks, of course. And uh, that was about a month in training there. And from there, we went to uh, the Gilbert Islands. That was the start of it. Okay, and what, what had, did anything uh, particular happen at the Gilbert Islands then? Or? Uh, yes, uh, we escorted a uh, CVE, which is a, a baby flat top aircraft carrier, uh, to uh, Gilbert Islands that, with, that had the fighter planes for the airfield there. Because uh, um, Ter Terrella, uh, after the Marines had uh, attacked it and wiped out the place, uh, the uh, CBs come in and uh, and uh, finished off the aircraft, uh, the uh, airfield, and these fighters come in and landed there and protected uh, the Gilbert Islands and various places from the Japanese bombing. When we arrived, they, they bombed us every night, and we had to leave uh, the area uh, escorting these ships. And they say, now this is hearsay, that we crossed the equator six times in one night, <laughs> back and forth. What's because the Gilbert Islands are practically right on the equator. Okay. What's the significance in crossing the equator? You become a shellback in the Navy, and uh, that way uh, you, you you receive a, a, a uh, diploma or something like that. You know, I still have it, uh, making you a shellback. And if you ever cross the equator again, well, then you don't have to go through the ceremony because they have quite a ceremony. But believe it or not, we didn't have to because we were being bombed. So, that they, so no one, when no one went through their ceremony that time? The people that had to cross the equator at that particular time on your ship? Uh, beg pardon again? No one, you didn't have the ceremony. No one had their ceremony. No, no, we didn't have the ceremony because, like I said, we were on the attack. And they, they didn't have it. <coughs> Thank heaven, because it's kind of nasty. Mm -hmm. Uh, from what I hear. <laughs> <laughs> you cut this out later, Sarah, but my dad was in the Navy too and he told me a little bit about it. Oh, did he? <laughs> yeah, that's why I asked you about that. I don't think anybody's talked about that yet. Uh, the last guy did. Huh? The last guy did. Oh, yeah, you did. Yeah. You cut this out of it then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. See, you're not supposed to hear my voice very much on this. We're supposed to be listening to you. Oh, great. But as All soon right. as you said across the equator, I said, I don't remember too many people talking about that. <laughs> yes. Um, yes. Uh, you said you said you were a radio man uh, uh, yes. during, during during this time when you were being. Yeah. What, what what was your? I mean, can you describe a typical. Well, well <coughs> not not that being bombed is typical. Uh, during battle, what were your duties? The what Navy you at that time had a radio station NPM in Honolulu, and they sent messages to all ships in the Pacific Ocean, all ships, and uh, we had to copy. Uh, they, uh, it was a uh, what they called Fox. We had to copy Fox uh, for five hours. Of, well, four hours, three, four hours of watch. We sat and copied Fox on a, uh, at about 24, uh, 25 words a minute, and uh, it was uh, sent in five-letter groups. The uh, the messages, and oh, it would take maybe I don't know. Uh, I've copied some that were a thousand groups, uh, the messages. And you would have in the heading, you would have the, uh, the, the uh, where the, uh, the originating uh, sender of the message, and then two, and uh, to the ships that were uh, to be, uh, to take action to the message, and then uh, information and that was just to the people who wanted to or should know about the, the, what was in the message, and we copied that for four hours a day or four or, hours or, a watch. Was it in code? Yes, it so was in radio wrong. code. Mm -hmm. Morse or international Morse. International Morse. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had the typewriter and we'd sit there and copy code, and that's it. 
anything? Can you think of um, anything significant or interesting? You, you never knew exactly then what you were typing, did you? You never knew. What oh the no, were? no, because uh, uh, the messages that we had directed to us or information to us would be uh, handed to a uh, officer, uh -huh. and he would break down these messages on a whatever. Uh, however, they broke the code. Um, you said you were under attack in the Gilbert Islands and you had to leave that. Where did you go? Uh, we were there, uh, let's see, uh, I, I got a, I don't think, uh, We arrived there in uh, January of uh, 44, and we stayed around uh, Tarawa, Macon, all the uh, islands in, uh, in, the, in the Gilbert uh, chain, and uh, back and forth doing our duty, escorting and stuff like that. And uh, then the uh, invasion was set up for the marshals, yeah, marshals, uh, and we were in the invasion in, of uh, Kwajalein. We escorted, believe it or not, the, uh, LSTs with troops. Uh, and if you you don't don't realize how slow those things can go, uh, our top speed was only 21 knots, and they were doing about five. And instead of going with an escort, you'd, you'd have escorts all the way around these LSTs. Instead of going like this, we had to go round and round the thing, and just like um, round the rosy, you know, <laughs> the escorts was going, because we couldn't go slow enough. Hmm. And. Uh, that was the first invasion that I participated in, was Kwajalein. And uh, from there on, we uh, went to about every island in the uh, uh, Mar uh, Marshalls, uh, Woji and Majuro and all of them, uh, assisting whatever. Uh, Did we you ever get to leave the ship on the front of these islands? Uh, I was on Tarawa. Uh, after we arrived and they got it settled down, uh, we had to go. Uh, we got a chance to go ashore. And uh, well, it's it's difficult to explain what it looked like. It just looked like somebody had come in and stirred it up, you know, and knocked down all the trees, and it was a mess. <laughs> That's about the only thing that you could say about the place. Were there um, locals there? Lo uh, in in Tarawa? Uh, uh, you mean Islanders? Mm -hmm. uh, no, they were on Macon and uh, Little Macon. Now Little Macon was where we sent all the natives and it was a beautiful island really. Yeah, I, I wouldn't like to go back there. So, so they were relocated? Huh? The, the Islanders were relocated? Yeah, because the, the island of Macon itself uh, had been invaded and shot up uh -huh. and everything like that, you know. And we took the uh, I, the islanders off there and, and uh, put them on Little Macon, which was better. And I don't know what happened to them after that. Whether they went back to Macon, I suppose they did after the war, but I don't know. <coughs> but Macon, it was close to Tarawa in the Gilberts. I can't tell you the distance, but it wasn't too far away. Um, 60, 70 miles, maybe no. something like that, I suppose. Uh, I'm guessing. But uh, that was the first place that, well, the only place actually during the whole war where the natives, when we pulled in and anchored at Little Bacon, the natives come out in their canoes, you know, and they brought us fruit, and just like you see in the movies. Really? <laughs> really, that was fantastic. Yeah. 
And they'd come aboard ship, some of them. <laughs> I suppose the chiefs. Um, what was it? How, did you were you able to communicate with your um, family back in Ohio? Uh, no, you, you, I wrote letters, but wrote you letters. couldn't tell them anything about what you was doing. The, the that censors, was censorship, the censors. Yeah. yeah. Did they ever tell you? Kind of did? Did they ever censor any of your letters? I mean, what your family said? Well, we don't know what's going on because. Oh yeah, they censored all our letters. Did they? Oh yeah. Uh, any anything that was sent off the ship was censored. Really? It was a little different in the Korean War. Now they didn't censor uh, mail in the they Korean didn't. War. They didn't in the Korean War. Mm -hmm. Where, did you go on land or in the? Did you come ashore on in Korea anywhere, or were you basically on the ship? Uh, Korea? Yeah. Oh yeah. So uh, we were on sh on shore. Uh, we had a lot of fun on Mokpo, Korea. Uh, Pusan is down here on the tip, and Mokpo's over here, on the will be on the western side. Uh, a little dinky place that had a baseball field, and uh, we had teams set up on the ship uh, to participate in a, a softball game, and we had a lot of fun because we had beer with us. <laughs> Uh, the ship carried beer, but she wasn't allowed to drink anything on the Gosh. ship. But you, you could go on a beach party, and, and uh, there was 3-2 beer, if you know what 3-2 beer is, well, it was 3-2 beer, and I, I had never drank, I had never drank in my whole life, and I don't think I drank then. And no, I didn't, because I gave mine away. When we go back to World War II here, and we will get into Korea. Um, the Marshall Islands. How long do you have any idea how long you were in that that battle? How long did that battle take? Oh my! Uh, the, the the actual battle for Kwajalein was only about three days, okay. and they finished that off. But the outer islands of uh, Majuro and and uh, what was the other one? Uh, Roy, Roy and Majuro. Uh, they had quite a battle there, and it took them a little bit longer. But uh, we went from Kwajalein, we went up to Majuro and Roy, and, and uh, we had, like I said, 76 millimeter guns, which would uh, fire, I don't know, I'm guessing about five or six miles, you see. And uh, we were passing one of the Japanese islands by the name of Mili part of the uh, uh, Marshall Island group, and uh, our captain decided he would bombard <laughs> the island. Okay. So we snuck into where we could maybe hit part of the island anyway, and we let off a couple of rounds, and they fired back with some big guns. <laughs> we decided to get the heck out of there because we were outgunned. <laughs> Was your ship ever hit? No, fortunately we were never hit in all that uh, 20 months that we spent in the Pacific, we were never hit. Yes, it is, because we had some nasty times. Okay, from the, from the, um, from those islands then, where did you go? Um, well, we would go back to Pearl Harbor every once in a while for uh, replenishment and repairs and stuff like that. Uh, we were re replenished at sea uh, if uh, if it had to be, you know, and we always took fuel at sea. But uh, we would go back maybe, oh, let's say six months, we'd go back to uh, uh, Pearl Harbor and be there maybe two, three weeks while they repaired whatever had to be repaired. And uh, they would take part of the crew uh, and send them to a, a place on a Hawaiian Island, uh, Oahu, and I got to stay at the Royal Hawaiian Hotel for 72 hours. <laughs> Can I explain what the Royal Hawaiian is for the, for the people that aren't used to Hawaii or, or World War II? Uh, what, what's the significance of that? Why is that special? Royal Hawaiian, at that, at that time, now this is 1940. Four. At that time, 
uh, if you were a civilian and wanted to get a room with the Royal Hawaiian, it cost you $100 a day, which would be, now I don't have any idea what it was, but it was a fantastic hotel. Uh, it, I don't know if you've ever seen pictures of it or not. Yeah, okay. It's a beautiful hotel. Fabulous. And we had a great time. There again, I said I didn't drink, so I, I didn't do any of that kind of stuff. What kind of things and, did you do? Oh, uh, we would go to the bars and sit and talk, and I would order maybe some kind of a, a pop or something like that, you know. And I love pineapple juice. I still do. And they, well, naturally, they had the best pineapple juice in the world. They even had bars set up, just pineapple juice. And uh, uh, just things like that. I don't know if we went to a movie. We had movies on the ship. I don't. I don't think we did much of that. What kind, kind of things you do on the ship when you weren't when you weren't in battle or, or standing your watch? Work. Work. I mean, of? yes, we painted and we chipped paint and uh, took care of the radio shack and all kinds of stuff. We had an area outside the radio shack uh, that we had to keep clean, had to keep painted, and uh, just work. That's all. Uh, you didn't lay around. Uh, they wouldn't let you do that. You had to do something. And we had like uh, duties in the radio shack itself. Uh, we, we could break messages ourselves. Uh, uh, the, uh, uh, what were they, uh, unclassified messages uh, that come in. They would be encoded also. And we'd break those down on a, on a little thing about uh, not quite this big. And it had strips, and each strip was lined up, you know, where you could get the break down the message. There were all kinds of stuff like that. We just never. I don't think you ever got a chance to. Well, you mentioned the movies that that were on ship. <laughs> what kind of movies did they show? Uh, very good movies, but. <laughs> Sometimes we would we would trade movies with other ships. Oh, and so many times we'd get the same movies back. I mean, it'd been around the ships. So we get the same. But we saw, uh, if I remember right, a uh, Glenn Miller movie. Um, oh, the one that was. Uh, 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 it was in a, in a place where they skied. I can't remember the name of that, but it was a good movie. And uh, things like that. Uh, whatever was the, the civilians were looking at at the time, we would get them eventually. But uh, like I say, sometimes we didn't get very good movies. Okay. Um after the Marshall Islands, you went back to Pearl Harbor, my understanding? Uh, after the Marshall, yeah, we did. We went back to Pearl Harbor. The fact is, we escorted a... Uh, I, is that the time? I think we escorted a troop ship back. And uh, it was a... Uh, a ship that they... that ran on... a passenger ship that ran between the States and, and the Caribbean Islands. I mean, a fancy ship uh, that had been converted oh, to okay. a troop ship. Okay. And their speed was about five knots faster than we were. So we were escorting this ship and the, the Admiral was on the, on the, pa on the uh, passenger ship. And uh, he must have had a hot date or something. But we got about halfway to Pearl Harbor and he sent us a message that uh, he'd go by himself and <laughs> so we followed at our best speed, which is about 17 knots. <laughs> That's interesting. Yeah. Okay. And about what time in 1944 was this then, by the time you got back to Pearl Harbor? Oh boy, well let's see. Uh, 
the marshal was there on February the 4th, and uh, probably sometime in March that we went back to Pearl Harbor. And then we had repairs, and there was a, a camp by the name of Andrews, Camp Andrews, uh, that um, the ship sent part of the crew to for relaxation, you know, R&R. &R. And uh, it was on Oahu, um, not near uh, Honolulu. It was over on the other end of the island, I believe. But uh, very nice, very nice place. And we spent time there. I think we was there for two weeks. Uh, I was. No, probably a week because they had to rotate the crews, you know. I think well, the whole crew got to attend. Uh, that would be in, um, oh gosh, I, I, I'd have to guess on that. Let's see if anyone had it. March, I suppose. March. March and April. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we went back to the Pacific again and our regular duties of escorting ships and what, whatever. And then uh, along came Guam, the Marianas, and we uh, were in the invasion of, of uh, Guam, uh, let's see, in July. Uh, yeah, July of 44. And from then on, it was all in the Mariana Islands of Tinian, Saipan, Guam. That's a was a, a, a yeah a bunch of islands right there uh, that were big time, and just going back and forth doing whatever duties we we were assigned to. They they gave us every kind of a sloppy thing. Is this during the time when you sunk the sub? My pardon? Is this when you sunk uh, the sub? No, uh, we sank the sub in February of 1945. We were escorting a couple of uh, uh, ships back to Pearl Harbor, oilers I think they were, tankers. And uh, there was uh, two or three destroyer escorts. And we picked up the uh, uh, contact at night and uh, sent a uh, uh, identification uh, message to them which they were supposed to if they were our ship you know they would send the proper code and they didn't they, they uh, went, went down and we picked them up on the sonar and I think we made about five different runs on on the, the ship, on the sub, with uh, hedgehogs and uh, depth charges. What is a hedgehog? Hedgehog is a uh, uh, I don't know quite this. Let's see. It, it's a it's a rack that has. 24 bombs on this, and they're on spigots, you know, uh, a post. Uh -huh. And the, the bomb is about yay long, and uh, you can fire them all at the same time. The fact is, they do go off at the same time. And you can uh, change how you want them to hit, because they go out over the bow. Okay. And we had to do about five knots, I think or something like that when we fired them. Otherwise, we'd go over the explosions. And uh, we fired, I don't know how many times, uh, the uh, hedgehogs, but we hit it about five different uh, times uh, with five different bombs. And we knew we sank it because the oil was coming up, you know, and we stayed there for 24 hours. And actually, we uh, fished for sharks because the sharks were circling around there, you see. We fished for sharks and uh, drag a big, a big piece of meat in the water and when we hooked it, 
Well, we'd take a big gaff and, and drag it what, and then cut it open to see if there was any uh, matter inside. You know, maybe a person or something like that. Right. We didn't find any actual evidence that we sank the submarine, and I didn't find out about it until I re-enlisted in the reserve uh, in uh, 1947. But what they did, they they had some kind of a no. Uh, I can't just think of how that how to explain that. Where they they had a bunch of people that uh, reviewed all the actions and stuff like that, and they had information, of course, from the Japanese, and the Japanese said that they had lost a submarine at the place where we where you were reported we sank it. Mm -hmm. Well, then they gave us credit for it. <laughs> this was 1947. Um, and we're going to get into your re-enlistment here in a little bit. You've brought us up to February of 45. Uh, yeah, okay. February of 45. Uh, that was uh, when they invaded the Philippines. Now, we didn't get into that, thank heaven. Uh, we were busy escorting ships back and forth, and uh, uh, we escorted a bunch of uh, ships to Ulithi, where they were making up the uh, invasion of Okinawa, making up the uh, ships. And uh, from there on, that was when we invaded Okinawa. We uh, escorted uh, CVEs at the time, uh, baby flat tops, <clears throat> uh, to Okinawa, and uh, <coughs> excuse me, uh, that was uh, <coughs> excuse me again, uh, March. Seven but days before D-Day. D-Day was April the first. Seven days before that uh, was when we when we arrived there. That's when the bombardment started, mm -hmm. and uh, we were in everything there at, at Okinawa. I mean, they had us on the uh, scouting line uh, for anti-aircraft duty and uh, back and forth. Anything that come up, they had us on. We had, the fact is we took. Uh, a bunch of uh, Marines into the island of Okinawa, a uh, scouting uh, bunch, and put them on, on the beach. And just little things like that. And uh, we were uh, under attack, uh, oh, I don't know how many times, but one time in particular, uh, we were attacked by uh, torpedo bombers, and uh, we shot down two of them. And drove the other one off. It was a, uh, a gaggle of three, and uh, we got two of them. But the one had fired a torpedo, and it went right underneath us, <coughs> right under the bridge. And that's where the radio shack is. If it had hit, I wouldn't be talking to you, because uh, the radio shack was right on the second deck above that. But nevertheless. Uh, the uh, radio man who stood watch with me uh, in the radio shack, three radio men were in there uh, on a watch. Okay, I was the uh, petty officer of the watch, and the fellow name uh, was uh, Lee Nicholson. He was with me, uh, and uh, then we had a, a what you call a striker. He was uh, learning the job, <clears throat> and he would do the taking the messages where they had to go and stuff like that. But uh, Lee, uh, they had him on the bridge at, at the battle station. He was on one of the talker phones. You've probably seen him. They had big earphones. They had a great big helmet that come down over the earphone. Okay, that's a talker. 
Uh, he was a 20 millimeter uh, gun talker. And uh, he, he said he saw, he and the uh, gunnery officer was on the bridge and they saw that torpedo coming and they ran to the other side of the bridge <laughs> they didn't want to be under view over where that thing went off and looked out and here it came out the other side. Well fortunately a destroyer escort only had a draft of eight feet and mostly uh, destroyers had a, had a draft of 12 feet and more sometimes, it all depends on how big they were. And uh, the Japanese would set their torpedoes for 12 feet because they thought we looked just like a destroyer. Mm. Really, it, it actually looked better than a destroyer. <laughs> okay. I have a, do we want to see a picture? Sure. Show us some pictures. Okay. I have a picture. Ouch. Of our ship. One, a bunch of other ones. Well, there's a little one. But I have a better one here someplace. Come on. Um, thank heavens, our, our ship looked like a destroyer. But, but there was a lot of these uh, destroyer escorts hit at Okinawa, but usually it was by Kamikaze. There's a better picture of it. Mr. Charlton, if you can just hold this up in front of you, she'll, she'll zoom in now. Oh, okay. okay. All right. That uh, is, is a picture of a destroyer escort. It's the early, uh, early ones. And, uh, did you get that? Yep. Oh, okay. And, uh, like I say, it, it, we only had a draft of eight feet. Uh, in other words, the amount that uh, was below the water line mm -hmm. of the ship, fortunately. <laughs> but we stayed there until July of, uh, July the 5th, I think it was, when we sailed back to the States. And, uh, California? You went back to California? Uh, it, it, well, Oregon. For Oregon. Portland, Oregon. And uh, we, we sailed down the Columbia River to Portland, Oregon. And that's about a hundred miles. And that was the best trip I ever took in my whole life. But it was at night. At night, down that uh. river. We had a pilot, naturally. Uh, river pilot and I was on duty but uh, I wasn't copying anything I wasn't doing anything at all as far as radio work was concerned so I took my chair out on the wing of the bridge and sat there and watched the lights of the <laughs> country go by oh it was beautiful really beautiful and then uh, from Portland uh, well, we stayed there I think until uh, September, and I was sent home on 30 days leave and transferred. Is that the first leave you had had since? Uh, yeah, that was the first uh, leave actually. Uh, you're supposed to get 30 days a year. I never did. Uh, anyway, from there, uh, I went home for 30 days and then went to uh, uh, Newport, Rhode Island, and that's where uh, they calculated that I had enough points, there was a point system at that time, I had enough points to go home. Now they had me lined up to go aboard the uh, uh, new carrier, uh, President Roosevelt, Franklin D. Roosevelt, and uh, Fortunately, I didn't have to do that. <laughs> I went home instead. And that was in? 1945, 1945. November of 1945. Okay. Um, and here, I'm trying to think of my dates here. The, the, um, 
the war wasn't was the war was over by then. Yeah, the war was I over in August so, yeah. of uh, in August. Yeah. Where were you then? In uh, and, at Portland. In Portland. Mm-hmm. And what they did, the Navy, bless their heart, and, and all their uh, good thinking, they decided that all rated uh, people would have to go on uh, shore patrol. Well, I had a uniform that didn't have a rate on it. So we crawled out through a hole in the fence and went on liberty. <laughs> oh, we had a wonderful time. Oh, my. Okay, so you went home, you got home in November of 45. Mm, yeah, I got to Portland. November. Got to Portland, okay. Yeah. Um, and, and then you went to. Oh, uh, oh no. Road. I'm sorry. I got home uh, in October. In October. Uh, and uh, yeah. And leave. And then they sent you up to Portsmouth. And then they sent me to Newport, Rhode Newport, Island. Newport, Rhode Island. Mm -hmm. And that's where you were separated. That's from where them. I was. Uh, actually, I was separated at Great Lakes. At Great Lakes. But they sent me back from from Newport to Great Lakes and discharged me from there. Well, what was it like when you got home? Did you have oh. a job to go to or? Uh. I don't know that the rest of us was home at the same time, all my buddies, and uh, none of them had been killed uh, that I can remember. Uh, and we had a, a big time, you know, fighting the war again and everything like that. So it, it was good, yeah. Did you get to go back to your old job or? I could have, but. Uh, I uh, met my wife at that time, and uh, she was going to school at Muskingum University, taking what they called a cadet course in teaching. You only had to go two years, then you got a, a cadet certificate to teach. And uh, she was in her last, her second year uh, when I met her. And, uh, let's see, uh, we were married in uh, July of uh, 1947, uh, but in the meantime, I had went to uh, dental, uh, worked at a dental factory, Weber Dental in Canton, Ohio and uh, worked at a steel mill in Cleveland uh, with my buddy and we didn't like that because it got cold up there. I was a welder, <laughs> I couldn't believe it or not. Mm -hmm. And uh, then I decided, uh, we are, I'm not going to work in a steel mill the rest of my life, so I went to radio school in Cleveland. Did you and, use the GI Bill for that? Yeah, oh yeah. Oh yeah, well, GI Bill paid for it, fortunately, I'll tell you, that was one of the best things the government ever did, best thing. Uh, because a lot of people got their, went through college, you know, mm -hmm. my, my brother-in-law did on the GI Bill. And the best thing that ever happened, but I don't know who designed that thing, but boy, it was a good one. Uh, but to get back to the story, I was in school, I think, for almost a year and a half, and uh, uh, we were married in 47. Well, then in 48, of June of 48, uh, I finished school, but the only thing that was open was a couple of stations that I didn't want to go to. Uh, as, uh, as an, well, what they called it was a radio engineer. Uh, in, a, in a radio station, the, the fellow that set up the transmitters and all that mm -hmm. kind of stuff, background, you know, for to run the radio station, is what I was going to school for. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I found out that there wasn't anything open uh, that I wanted to do, my good buddy was a, a conductor on the railroad. And he said, uh, well, why don't you go over to the office there at 55th and Euclid in Cleveland and uh, see if you can get a job on the railroad. Okay. 
because Esther was pregnant at that time, see. And I had to do something <laughs> to get a job. <coughs> Excuse me. But uh, they hired me. And I spent 39 years on the railroad, all in all. And then Truman, bless his heart, I, I was always, I, I thought he was a good man. But I only had uh, till July of uh, 1951, my enlistment ran out. So Truman decided we would extend the, the enlistments for one year. And I was stuck in Korea at that time. <laughs> uh, how'd, you that, up? how'd you find out, to, how were you called up for that? How did someone... Well, I, I, I enlisted in the reserve in, in July of 47. A friend of mine that I was in school with, uh, he, he was in the reserve and he said, boy, says you can have a wonderful time. Well, we did. We went to dances at the big hotels and all that kind of, and uniform, you know. And that was really nice until the Korean War come along. Then it wasn't so nice. Uh, and let's see, that would be July of 47. And the Korean War started in, in June of 1950. And they called me up in October. And I was in the inactive reserve. I wasn't even in the active reserve. And there again, Truman, bless his heart. <laughs> I blame it all on him. Actually, it wasn't his fault. But uh, uh, they needed radio men. They always need radio men in the war. And uh, they, they called me in uh, to active duty in uh, November the 7th, uh, 1950. And uh, I went back to Great Lakes and got all my shots and stuff like that, you know. Did you have to do all that training again like you did in basic? No, no, you didn't no I didn't because I was in the reserve, you see. The reserves didn't have to train. Uh, after getting all my shots and stuff like that, which, which took about seven days uh, to get all the papers and stuff like that, well, whatever had to be done uh, to get you back in the service. And then they sent us to uh, Alameda, California, to the ship that was in Mothballs, the, the Hit, Hit Chitty, it was a fleet tug. And uh, the, uh, let's see, that would be, oh, I think the latter part of November that, they, uh, that we arrived out there to the ship. And uh, I think maybe 20 of us, or a few more, were put on the ship which was in dry dock. And uh, they were getting it ready for sea again, you know. And uh, we had to stay on watch and all that kind of stuff. But we didn't have to stay aboard. Uh, I had my wife come out. And uh, we stayed in, uh, she and I stayed in uh, naval housing at Alameda. And we were there until February of, uh, let's see, February of what, 51? Yeah. And uh, that was when we were re recommissioned. And sent to San Diego for something. I don't know why we were sent down there, really. Uh, part of uh, our training, I suppose, uh, for, for C. And uh, from there, uh, I think we were there two weeks. We went to uh, Pearl Harbor again. And we picked up, oh, we, yeah, we picked up uh, a yard oiler, which is a small ship that they use in the yard, uh, Navy yards, and a yard water tender, and a big barge of dirt, all in a line behind our tug, and towed those first to Midway, where we dropped off the barge of dirt, 
Can you imagine a barge of dirt going to Midway? Well, it's all sand there. Evidently, somebody wanted to plant a garden or something. I don't know. But anyway, we deposited or, or left the barge of dirt there and continued on to Japan, where that we, uh, where they needed these uh, small yard uh, all there and the yard what they, they were small ships that looked just like uh, oilers, you know. Uh, but they were, oh, they weren't very big. Uh, they weren't as big as we were, but they had crews on, no power, except for lights and stuff like that, water, so forth. But they didn't have any control uh, other than trying to keep the thing in line, you know, stood to watch that way. And we towed that, I, I didn't, I'm glad I didn't have to ride those things, but <laughs> anyway, we towed them all the way to Japan. And I think we arrived there in April, I believe. And they sent us right up to uh, Wonsan, Korea. And that's where we spent most of our time in Korea, was Wonsan. We would go there for uh, three months, which was about all the stores that we had, food and stores and stuff like that. Uh, and then we would come back to Sasebo, Japan and spend about two weeks there and replenish and whatever had to be done, repairs, and then right back to Wonsan again. Well, uh, in the meantime, uh, now this was in, uh, what did I say, uh, April, and we stayed there until February of uh, 52, uh, back and forth to Wonsan. We were back and forth three times. And then they, every once in a while, they would take us from Wonsan and we'd go to Hangnam, which was up the coast from Wonsan. Now Wonsan is north of the 38th parallel. It's, it was in North Korea all the time. And they would shoot at us, and we'd try to get things done in there, you know. We didn't fire at them. Oh, yes, we did, too. We fired on them a couple of times. Uh, but, uh, but your main job was towing things, right? Uh, well, uh, the main job in Wonsan was not towing things. It, it was uh, really escorting these uh, ships that come in to Wonsan through the minefields. Uh-huh. You were at the 30th, and uh, one song up above the 38th parallel, that's where we left off. Yes, above the 38th parallel. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's where we spent our most of our time in Korea. But uh, they would, every once in a while, take us away from there to do duties like uh, we had to go someplace, I can't remember the name of that uh, place, where a uh, rock or ROK, uh, uh, PC had grounded. They were on the ground and they couldn't get pulled loose. And so they sent us down to, to pull them loose, which we did. We could, we could tow just about anything. And uh, some of them can't find them. Anyway, uh, they would take us down there and we, we operated quite often with uh, um, uh, minesweepers. They had uh, maybe, oh, if I can remember, uh, four, five, maybe small wooden minesweepers. They had to be wood, otherwise they would attract the, the mine and get blown up themselves. But uh, uh, we operated with them uh, as a, uh, well, uh, our captain was the uh, commander of the task unit, which is the smallest thing in the task force, the task unit. And uh, he was a, the commanding officer, only a lieutenant, but it didn't have to be much of an officer. And uh, we operated with them 
Uh, I didn't like that because they would go along and, and sweep a channel. Uh, we, was, we, they couldn't sweep the whole thing uh, of one song harbor. It was a huge harbor. Uh, but they would sweep a channel into the harbor itself. Was this a, a, what significant the harbor itself? It was under the control of, of the... Of, uh, the North Koreans. It was under the control of North yeah, Korea. Okay. Yeah. They had control of the harbor. And uh, what we had at that time was a bombardment. It was a destroyer at, at, uh, at times. A destroyer would set in there and fire uh, one of their turrets. Uh, if it was a uh, Fletcher class, they had a single mount or if the uh, later class where they had two in a, in a turret. But they would co continuously for 24 hours fire that one gun on uh, various places on the, in the harbor. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know what they shot at, but uh, because there was a, a road that came down from the north uh, through Hong Nam right alongside the ocean. And this, this was a cliff right there. And uh, that was the only road that they had to supply the south. There was another road over, over here in the middle of the island. But this one road uh, was... Uh, that the North Koreans had uh, would supply yeah. their troops in the south. Right. Okay. Yeah. And they, they, that, they had a supply train of trucks that would come down this road. Well, they would have... Uh, this is another part of the story, but that they would have... Uh, a, a destroyer out here and the destroyer would knock out the first truck and then he'd go and shoot out the last truck and then just blow the whole convoy because they couldn't get away. They couldn't go forward or backward. And uh, that's what they did. Well this one destroyer in here, he just continually fired at one song. And they did that for over, well over a year continuously. And every once in a while they would have bigger ships come in and fire. They had the New Jersey battle wagon come in there one time and uh, fired at something I don't know what they shot at. Of course they shoot in about 25 miles, you know. Uh, but uh, the Jersey come in there and this one gun that the North Koreans had there in the harbor fired at the New Jersey and hit her in a gun turret and killed a bunch of people and she turned around and come out of there. But it was just escort duty like that okay. for a tug, okay? But uh, these poor old minesweepers, they had to keep that thing swept and they had to sweep it every day because the Chinese would come down with their junks and drop uh, mines in there at night and would chase them out, but we never could catch them. They were too fast for us. <laughs> we only had a ship of 15 knots. <laughs> But uh, that's what we did in Korea. We got shot at and we chased mines. Well, then, on the other hand, we went down, uh, let's see, pulled that PC off. Uh, I can't tell you the name of the place, but it was between Wonsan and Pusan. And then they sent us around on the other side of the island at Incheon, and uh, we went to a little island by the name of Chodo. It was right on the, uh, well, the, the mouth of the river that went to Pyongyang, the capital of uh, North Korea. And they had word somehow or another, this Chodo, uh, we had troops on. We had captured it a long time ago. And they had word that the, the North Koreans were going to invade this island and take it back. So they sent us around to uh, Chodo and we operated with the British fleet for, I don't know how long, a couple of weeks, maybe a month, I don't know. I can't remember, that is. And uh, that was the other part of the story. Well then, as I said before, we would go back to Sasebo, Japan, and would have liberty. We could go to uh, 
Well, I, I did go on a trip one time to Nagasaki, where the atom bomb hit, mm -hmm. and it was still a, a wreck. I mean, uh, this was 1940, what, 45? No, 1951, yeah. yeah. Uh, and it was still a mess. But we took a train trip there, Japanese train, from Sasebo to Nagasaki. That was fun. Well, we didn't shoot and kill somebody all the time, you know, or try to. Uh, we had good liberties. Good. Uh, especially, and uh, I think we were back at Sasebo three times, and we had, we had good liberty every time. Did they keep you in Korea until the Korean armistice? Oh, no. No, uh, we come back in uh, February of 52 to Hawaii, and uh, they decided to get rid of me there, so uh, they flew me back from Hawaii to uh, Traverse Air Force Base in California, and a bus down to Treasure Island, where I was discharged. It was a little different than World War II then, wasn't it? Most everybody that went in World War II, you were there for the duration, right? Uh, you, yes. Yeah, no. You had to have your points. Yeah, there was a point system in yeah. World War II. And they didn't have that that I know of in, in the Korean War. Uh, my enlistment was coming up, uh, and, and uh, the extension also. So uh, they decided to send me home. So I was discharged on March the 5th in 1952. That was the end of it. That was the end of your service. Yep, that was the end of my service. <clears throat> Did you join any of the, like the American Legion or, or VFW or anything? Oh yeah, like I'm a member of the uh, American Legion. Okay. Uh, I didn't join the other ones. I, I'm not much of a joiner as far as that goes. But, uh, yes. Uh, and one of the strange things uh, our government, and you, you know about this, uh, would not let our soldiers or sailors or military people accept medals from a foreign country. In 19, uh, let's see, I think they changed that in 1954 or something like that. And, uh, they had, the Korean people had a, a medal that uh, they uh, they gave to the uh, people who were in action in Korea. And with this medal, they sent this thing here along with the medal. And uh, oh, as soon as I get it open, uh, it, it's written from the president of Korea to whoever, mm -hmm. uh, congratulating them on their, uh, or I'm, I mean, uh, how do I want to say that, to uh, thanking them for their service mm -hmm. in Korea. And uh, I was appreciative of that, really. Mm -hmm. That's actually the first time I've seen that. Is that right? Mm -hmm. I'll be darned. Everybody yeah. in, that was in. Before. Yeah, oh, down. It's written in Korean. Yeah. And then it's uh, English on that side. If you care to look at it. Uh, oh, I, I'm pretty proud of that. That is very nice. Uh, I, I'm looking for something in here. And I think I can find it. Uh, did you ever see a V-mail letter? No, that, that ain't it. I have someplace at home a V mail that I sent to to my sister. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I didn't know that that's what it was. <laughs> if you find that, we'd like to scan it. Uh -huh. If you do find it, yeah. we'd like to scan well, it, it. It's not in here. Uh, it's at home someplace. Ah, uh, uh, fiddle file. I'm not finding what I want. Uh, well, not there. I mean, it's there someplace, but I can't find it. Uh, but I will. 
Okay. Uh, that's it. Okay. Uh, Mr. Tarleton, uh, we'd like to thank you for coming in today. We really do appreciate it. You've had some fascinating stories. Um, again, thank you for coming in today and thank you for your service. Uh -huh. Thank you for having me.